experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. Dagla dung war jpe dra no pa jpe ke tar pa dung dum shake and pay pa do cho pa jpe tam shake so jpe manam ka dam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dung dum dug now dung drow nor do la na me pa yang dak pa zog pe zang zhu bren po she to pa sha. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Do they ring me song te ni ma sang ta sang ki pa du lu na ki sang ke wa la ko. You take refuge in the kind root lama and lineage lamas. You take refuge in the deities and the mandalas of the yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the Eye of Wisdom. We take refuge in the kind root Lama and lineage Lamas. We take refuge in the deities and the Mandalas of the Yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, that, um, <laughs> Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. Transcend Sawa Dangur Parje Pe Pa Dan Lama Dam Pa Nam La Kapsu Chio Yidam Kil Gurgi La Sok Nam La Kapsu Chio Sange chom den de nam la kap su chi o. Dam pe cho nam la kap su chi o. Pa pe ge du nam la kap su chi o. Pa wo ka jo cho kyong song me song ye she gi chang dang dem pa nam la kap su chi o. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment. I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma, and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas cultivated the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Shang Shu Ning Po Chi Ki Ba Sangye Nam La Kap Su Chi Cho dan chang shu sam pa yi, so klang de shen kap su chi. Zhitar nong gi de she gi, shang shu tuk ni ke pa dan. Shang shu sam pe la pa la, de da grim shen e pa
In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangye cho dang so ki cho nam la Shang ju ba du dag ni kab su chi Dag yi jin so ki pe so nam gi Dro la pen shi sangye ju pa sho May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Ma nam ga dam yam pe sem chen dam she de wa dang de we gu dang dem pa jor chi. Dug now dang du now gi gu dang dra wa jor chi. Dug now me pe de wa dang mi dra wa jor chi. May ring chak dang ni dang dra we tang nam la ne pa jor chi. Okay. That concludes the the opening prayers. Take a deep breath. Fill your lungs with fresh, clean, pure air. Expand the belly. Hold the breath. Exhale. Squeeze all the negative, stale, dark air out. Compress the abdomen. Hold that empty breath. Breathe in through both nostrils. Fresh, clean, pure air coming in. Hold it. Exhale. Squeeze all that negative, stale, dark air out. Breathe in. Exhale. Breathe in, watching your breath come in, fresh, clean, pure air coming in. Exhale, stale, negative, dark air out. Breathe in very deeply. And exhale very completely. Relax and breathe normal. Just watch your breath. 
sit in a meditation position for a few moments, just watching your breath come in and exhale, stay out negative dark air. Visualize the space all around you as being your, your Buddha field. It's peaceful, calm, secure, safe. Has everything you need for right now. And even through being connected through the cyberspace of the internet, so when we are all connected. But even without the computers and the cell phones, we're connected through our hearts. So our Buddha field is connected through our hearts. Beyond this and out through all the rest of the world, there's so many thousands of people right now, not many, many more who are meditating or chanting or doing practice. And we're all connected with all those people from all different nations. All the space around us is all naturally pure. We are part of that naturally pure. Now take a deep breath. Fill your lungs with fresh, clean air. Raise your arms up above your head. Bring your hands together. Stretch your back. Stretch your arms. Stretch your neck. Twist your body to the left, the waist, as far as you can. Come back to the center. Twist the body to the right, as far as you can. Come back to the center. Relax your arms, open your eyes, breathe normal. Okay. So we've been talking about the generation stage of visualizing the deity. And so first we have to visualize the environment, the space all around the deity as being the Buddha field. So just as a little bit of an exercise, we just did that in the space that we're in, the room that we're in, the way that we're interconnected is, is a Buddha field. If we can maintain that purity in our minds. And then we think about the palace, we think about the mandala that, the, that supports the Buddha, that is um, the family of the Buddha, so to speak. The consort and the bodhisattvas, the male and female bodhisattvas, the, the dakinis, the, uh, the, the um, 
the protectors, the Dharma Palas, the Dharma Palas of the Dharma protectors, all part of the, the mandala. And through each of the different practices that we'll, we'll do over the years, uh, we'll learn more about them, we'll experience them more. We'll begin to see these different mandalas. We'll be able to experience the Buddha fields more and more. So we're preparing ourselves for that through developing this generation stage of the meditation. So last time we talked about the palace, so now we, we're moving to talk about the deity, the deity that is within this palace. It is the, the palace is the deity. So if you're following me on, on page six of the text that uh, I'm provided with uh, chapter seven, part one and two. So we're on um, page six, where it says letter B, big letter B, where it says for the, uh, the second aspect of the development stage, meditating on the form of the deity. So we begin to think about the deity themselves. So I'm going to put this uh, image on the screen. This is White Tara. Okay. So we begin by talking about the deity seat. So here we are purifying the conceptual grasping and clinging, or rather the habitual tendencies of sentient beings to abide and take birth from a mother's lotus through the sperm, ovum, heat, moisture, and so forth, the different ways in which the, the uh, deity is born. So in this case, here, White Tara is sitting, if you look down here, at the bottom of this picture, you see that there's a, uh, there's a body of water, and then there's a, a land mass here. So this deity is a, a miraculous birth. Uh, this is green, uh, white Tara. So she's not, of a, uh, she's not a human being, although she has a human being um, uh, uh, image here so that we begin to understand and see ourselves as the, as the Buddha, as White Tara, as the different deities and so on. So here in either corner are two other Taras that are supporting this White Tara, that are in support of her, not literally in a physical support, but in a spiritual support. And then, so we're looking at the seat on which the, the, the deity is sitting on. So here we see this lotus pedestal so, uh, and then if you look on there, uh, you see white Tara sitting, there is this white disc that you can see underneath her robes. So this is what we're gonna be talking about. So this, this conceptual grasping and clinging has been purified. And through the uh, visualization of the practice, through the, uh, all the work that we have done up to this generation stage of this Buddha field and of the environment and so on, We've been steadily purifying that. So now we're visualizing this deity in this way. So the result of the purification is called the Nirmanakaya or the emanation body form of the Buddha. This emanation body arises in whatever form and whatever way is necessary to tame beings, but without being sullied by the four ways of taking birth. So the four ways of taking birth is the womb birth, Mammals are, are born as, in the womb birth, uh, to be born in, as an egg birth. So uh, birds, fowl, are born as an egg. Some reptiles are born in an egg. Uh, birds are actually reptiles, aren't they? So, uh, so, that, so uh, much in the same way, uh, the womb comes from, a, uh, from, comes from the egg of the female and the sperm of the male coming together in the womb. In the egg, it's done uh, within that, that animal, and then it's, it's uh, given birth, the egg is given birth, and then they um, hatch the egg, they, they incubate the egg, and so on like that. So in that way, it's similar. But then there's also birth from heat and moisture. So this would be something like larva, the larvae that would appear on leaves or appear on, on a, uh, a slow-moving water uh, like a pond or something like that, when different insects 
would lay their, their larva and so on. Maybe uh, frogs and so on are born in the same way, I believe. So uh, there's many different uh, uh, insects and animals that are born through heat and moisture. And then there's the miraculous birth. So the miraculous birth has a couple of different things about it. Uh, one might be that um, beings are born uh, in a hell realm, that they go immediately to a hell realm without being born in a womb because of the heinous crimes that they have committed, the, the, the killings that they have done and the, the terrible deeds that they have done. Um, there might be, from good deeds, they, beings may be born in the God realm and just spontaneously just born as a god and, and have very, very long lives, very uh, serene, uh, very pleasurable, uh, but at the same time, uh, not connected with other beings. They have no compassion. The, the hell beings uh, are only no suffering, severe, terrible suffering of, of being born again over and over again in that hell realm and dying over and over again in that hell realm. But then there are also some uh, very special beings like uh, Pamas and Baba, who are human beings who were said to have been born on the lotus of, a, of a, uh, the pistol of a lotus. So um, to have this very uh, miraculous birth like that. So if this might be as, a, as an analogy for the, the womb being the lotus, being like the, the lotus, and these beings being born this way, and from the very beginning that they were very high, uh, high incarnations of previous beings and so on. So in this way, they may be considered as being born a miraculous birth uh, because right away they, they became uh, very, uh, very spiritual beings, very, very highly evolved beings. So this is being born a deity. You know, this may be born a deity or, or to uh, be born in the uh, celestial realms, to be born as, uh, in, in uh, realms that we cannot see or uh, realms that are uh, like cosmic or realms that we cannot see that are in the ground, that are like um, the nagas uh, below the surface of the, of the ground that we cannot see all miraculous birth like this. So since awakened mind is inherently pure, the form is clear and the ultimate wisdom of the union of skillful means and wisdom. So what this means is in the deity, their mind is completely awakened when they are born, when they are manifest. They have their form is a clear light. They do not have a ordinary form like a human being. We use these images, these pictures, to help us to understand that what these beings are as, as we can be like these beings, but they themselves are as clear light, as, as pure beings. Um, this is called the ultimate wisdom of the union of skillful means and wisdom. So these are, this would be like illusory body. So, so the agent of the purification of this is having been on the path, being on the actual path of, of, uh, of enlightenment, whereby we visualize it in the center of this immeasurable deity palace as a lotus flower, the top which is the mandala of the sun, uh, which is red in color. And the top that is the mandala of the full moon, which is right in color. And then are stacked one on top of uh, uh, each other and evenly positioned in the center of the lotus. So if we look at this lotus flower now in this picture, we see this lotus, which is representative of this purity. And the lotus, of course, comes from the body of water that is below it, which represents samsara, which represents the ocean of samsara, the ocean of suffering. So from this muck and mire that is at the bottom of this ocean of suffering comes the stem that then comes, breaks the surface of the water and blossoms as this lotus flower here. 
And then here with uh, white tar, like I said, there is the white disc, but we don't see the yellow disc, the sun disc, but it is there. It is implied that it is there. We may see a little rim of it, um, but the peaceful deities are sitting on the uh, white disc of the moon, of the compassion. The red disc, which we can't see in this particular image, represents the wisdom and is represented by the sun. So the sun and the moon, the moon disc, the white disc, and the, uh, the red disc is the wisdom, and the white disc is the compassion. And so we say that the sun disc is very, very hot. The, the, the hot wisdom, the heat of the wisdom, and then the cooling of the moon, the cooling of the compassion. So when we look at these pictures, we begin to see these things, we begin to recognize these elements, and we begin to put together the meaning of what this deity represents. So here in the case, it says in the case of Zwala, Tantra, or other visualizations, the principal deities of the five Buddha families are seated on top of animals, jeweled thrones, uh, sun and moon and lotus seats. So their seats have five layers stacked one on top of another. So what that means is, let me see if I got a picture here. Um, yes, so here, um, can you see this picture of Sakyamuni? Okay. So this picture here of Sakyamuni, Sakyamuni is sitting on a lotus throne and here is the throne below him. And, uh, and, and, and very often you'll see the animals, you'll see elephants, you'll see, um, uh, you'll see peacocks, you'll see different animals that are there that represent the strength, the power of that particular deity. So here usually with Buddha Sakyamuni we would see um, lions that would be there showing his courage. So then the bodhisattvas would be seated on a, uh, a sun and moon disc lotus seat, but they would not be on a throne like this. So the Buddhas would be on a throne like this. The bodhisattvas would be more on a, uh, or just on a lotus, on a lotus throne, like, um, like here, the, uh, White Tara is sitting on. And then the sages are corresponding to the six realms are seated on lotus seats like this also, but they would, um, but they might be standing as well. So there's different variations of this. So we begin to learn about all these in the different deity yogas. And then the wrathful gatekeepers are seated only on sun disks. And, very, and they usually are standing. They're in a standing position on sun disks. So uh, let me see. I think I got Malakala here. So here's Malakala. Well, he's seated. He's seated on, um, he's seated on, the, on the sun disk. You see the, uh, the red orange sun disk. And here he's sitting on top of these human figures that are seem to be agonized. So he's rising up from this human nature, from this suffering human nature, is what this represents. So these are just a few examples, and each deity practice will have its own specific visualizations outlined in those particular texts. So there's pure symbolism. So here on this page, number seven, you can see here that there's a lion supported throne represents the four levels of fearlessness. An elephant supported throne represents 10 enlightened powers. A horse supported, a horse supported throne represents the four legs of magical powers. A peacock supported throne represents 10 magnetizing powers. A crane uh, and so on, all these different animals, all these different aspects here are showing what this composite picture is representing. So, and this is part of kind of like being a Buddhist scientist. 
being able to bring all these things together that, that register with our, our minds, with our memories, to give us a understanding of, uh, of the power of, of what the activity of that particular deity is. So we begin to read these pictures much in the same way that we would read a book. And the power of this was back in the old country, back in Tibet and India, places like that, most people were illiterate and they didn't have books, they couldn't read and so on. But the lamas, the teachers, would be making a circuit. They would come around to their villages once every several months or maybe once a, every six months or once a year or something like that. And they would come and they would give teachings. And many of the teachings were these deity yoga teachings and they would have these elaborate tanka paintings or these statues that could be rolled up, the, the, the paintings could be rolled up. And so the lamas could bring them, they were very portable. And sometimes they would bring them and uh, the families would commission to have their own tanka paintings and they would have them in their home. And they would learn to read these tanka paintings through the deity yoga uh, empowerments that the lamas would be giving to them so that they could understand, they would read them like books and so on. So this gives us a little bit of an understanding of what some of these figures represent. So you can take these parts here, and there's more to come, and begin to apply them to the many pictures that you can find on the internet, or maybe you've got some tanka paintings in your home, or you have some books that are tanka paintings, and you can begin to apply them and, and see the similarities and see the differences between these and what all this means, what all the, all the, um, the images represent. So the four Maras or demons, they were represented by those, those human beings that were on that picture of, uh, of Mahakala. I'm gonna go back and bring that up. Uh, if I go here. So these Maras, these are often represented as Maras or the demons, the demons of, of human beings, you know, those, those, um, those inner qualities that we have of our human nature that are full of hatred, that are full of just jealousy, that are full of uh, attachment and delusion and so on. So these, these beings here represent those Maras. So the Maras, it says here there's four maras or demons that are the type of forces that obstruct spiritual practitioners. So the four are the, the mara of the aggregates. These are the psychophysical components of an individual and the environment. And what they represent are delusion. So the delusional qualities that we have that, that these things are possessing us or these things are exterior forces that are causing us to do uh, malevolent things, uh, evil things, terrible things and so on is because of these demons. But really it's within ourselves. So we have to recognize these demons as being ourselves. So it's our delusion that keeps us from, from recognizing that. Uh, Lance, quick question. Yeah. Um, so how do you differentiate the, this demons or what's the difference between them and the wrathful deities? Oh, a lot. The wrathful deities are Buddhas. And their wrathfulness is their fierce compassion. They, they are not wrathful. They're not hateful in any way, shape, or form. However, they are very, very fierce because they have to be greater, more powerful than the demons that they are there to overcome. So the peaceful deities, if the, if the pacification and the enrichment of the peaceful deities is not enough to be able to overcome those demons, then those peaceful deities emanate themselves as what we call the wrathful deities in their wrathful form or their fierce form because then it's more powerful to be able to overcome those maras that are very, very 
powerful themselves and very deep seated. So we can't confuse. We have to understand the difference between the wrathful deities and the demons. It's two different, two different um, um, ideas. So the one in the picture that you're showing is uh, a demon, right? No, the black. This is this is a Dharma Pala. This is Mahakala. So he is not the demon. He is a, a Dharma protector, and okay. he is a, he's, he's considered to be wrathful or fierce is the correct word. These beings down here below that he's sitting on, they are the demons. Oh, uh, okay. They are the Maras. Isn't that like isn't that like a male and female? Uh, that he's be. that he's be. sitting on. It might be. I I, um, I don't know. So, so I think my at least my understanding. Well, of, actually, this no. looks like just one being. But then there's you see this. this is, oh, uh, these are the faces of uh, that's his uh, garland. Are you talking about the little heads? Um, yeah, those little heads are part of a garland that is around the neck of uh, Mahakala. So we're going to get to talking about that. Okay, so those are the demons or the afflictive emotions. What, these guys here? Yes. These are the, um, these are, represent the, the victory of overcoming what, what Mahakala has overcome for him to be a Dharma Pala. So these mm -hmm. were aspects of his being that he overcame. So those, those 50 heads represent those, uh, emotional, those emotional afflictions that he overcame is what they represent. Right. You see so, faces here? Yeah. So, yeah. So, Lance, so those are like trophies? Um, well, I wouldn't call them trophies, but uh, some people might. But I, I okay. think that they're representative of the afflictive emotions that that this uh, mahakala that he has overcome yeah okay let's is mahakala the wrathful form of chakrasambara are they two complete are they two separate deities manjushri the wrathful form of manjushri yes okay okay thank you yes mm. who who is the wrathful form of chakrasambara is, is there one? I'm sure there is, and um, it might be Vajrakalaya. Okay, okay. I'd have to, I'd have to check. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't remember. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, um, okay, so the first, so the, so we were talking about the four maras. So the first one is delusion. The first mara is delusion, the psychophysical component of an individual and the environment that they are in. So then the next point is the mara of disturbing emotions. So what this means are the emotions that have not been cleared away, that keep coming back, the contamination, that you can purify your mind for a period of time. But then how stable is that when combinations become manifest in your life? Somebody's got their microphone on. Can they turn that off, please? Maybe it's AJ. My bad, sir. Fine, thank you. Okay, so, so the contaminations, the disturbing emotions that still continue to come up would be the second of the Maras. Then the third Mara is the Mara of what's called the Son of the Gods. And this refers to distracting thoughts that follow after pleasurable objects. So what this is, if you can imagine, you know, here are these gods, but then here are these sons of the gods. And the sons of the gods are very often very irre uh, 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 irreverent. They don't, they don't have any respect and they abuse the power that, that they may have been born into. You know, um, uh, if I can be a little gross about it, but many people who are very wealthy and so on, they have children who have no respect for anybody, they have no respect for the money, they have no respect for their families and so on, and they're terribly irreverent for what blessings they, they do have and so on. 
So this is an example of the Mara of the son of the gods who have these destructible, these thoughts that all they do is stay in this, this pleasure and everything is for them. That they be, they're very, very selfish and have no compassion and so on. So these beings, these beings have a proclivity to control others and to control the environment. This is the way in which they manifest their power by controlling others. Everybody is here for, for my sake, for their sake. All this world is here for my sake. I can use it with impunity. I can do whatever I need. So this is the third Mara, the Mara of, of the sons of the gods, those that control others or control the environment. And the fourth one is the Mara of the Lord of Death. And this is being controlled at the time of death, that we surrender our ability to be able to um, direct, to manage, to say what it is that we, how it is that we want to die. You know, we had some degree of control when we were conceived. We talked about that in the Bardo Todal that we were talking about these past number of weeks. So there's, there's a degree of that that is controlled by karma and so on. So now, then we go through our life and we have all this free will, we have all this control. But how many of us prepare for our death? Or do we, we just you know, say, well, I'm not going to die. I don't have to think about it. So it doesn't matter to me, my family will take care of it, or they're gonna take me to the hospital and the doctors are gonna save my life or, or whatever thoughts they may have about it. What it means is they've surrendered all this control of how it is that they want to die. And the, that, that dying, that, that transfer of consciousness, that leaving the body, the physical body, that leaving the intellect, the brain behind, and then releasing the pure spirit is very, 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 very powerful and very, very sensitive. And it's a gift that we give ourselves to be able to manage, to be able to control. So if we are going through our practices, this is what we are developing so that we are in that Buddha field, so that even if it comes, in a, in a moment of, of, of uh, unexpected trauma, an accident, or something like that, that we are already in the habitual tendency of being a Buddha, of being a holy enlightened one, so that when we lose our body, we don't even recognize that because we're already in our, our true mind and our, and our true nature. We're already there. Or that if it's taken away from us, that we remember, we recall very, very quickly that, oh, I've lost my body. I must be in the bardo. I've been there many times because I've been born many times. I've died many times. I've dreamed many times. And most important, I've meditated many times because every meditation is a rehearsal for entering into the bardo of death and the, and the bardo of reality. So the more that we become familiar with that process, with that transference of consciousness, the more that we prepare ourselves for that, the more likely we are to have a good experience in the bardo, in the bardo of death, that we can immediately be liberated. Or if we can't be immediately be liberated in the bardo of death, we're immediately liberated in the, the bardo of reality. And we see the different Buddhas. We recognize the different Buddhas. Not with these images. Not with these images. We're not seeing these images. We are seeing what these images represent. That's why it's important to understand all this generation stage of what they represent. And all these things that we as human beings need to be able to, to use our brain to be able to make relationships with, to, to make associations with. 
but then ultimately it becomes something not of the brain it becomes something of the heart we become totally familiar with the bodhicitta totally familiar with the loving kindness the compassion the joy and the equanimity that's what we see that's what we recognize and we do that through recognizing light not the light that we see with our eyes but the light that we see with our heart so this is what we're building up to to be able to recognize this to be able to see these things so with the mara of the lord of death being it means that we are surrendering our control to whatever we're losing control and we you know so how we are going to die what's going to happen to our body when we die what's going to happen to our inner breath that we release when we die is 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 out of our control unless we overcome that mara and all these other mars so that's why we need to be aware of these four maras it's very important so you should write these down you should think about these you should research these and and be able to see you know where these come up and and other uh teachings and practices and so on this is a very profound um concept that we need to be able to examine and articulate for ourselves so now this second stage of actual actually giving rise to the deity in the mandala is explained in accordance with the threefold vajra method so now we're we're we've, we've created the, the seat of the buddha everything that we've been talking about tonight has been talking about the seat of the buddha so now we're talking about giving rise to the deity through the threefold vajra method so the threefold Vajra method is explained in, in different traditions in slightly different ways. And uh, it's good to, you know, study them all. But right now we're going to talk about the indestructible ground as one. We're going to talk about the indestructible path as another. And we're going to talk about the indestructible fruition, which is the third, the, the, the result of the path. So what this means is now there's the ground, there's the path, and there's the fruition, the result. So I've talked last week or so, I've talked about that we start off on this ground. You know, here's where we are. We got all our knowledge. We got all our books. We got all our teachings and so on. This is our ground. This is our starting point. And we want to get to liberation. We want to get to enlightenment. We want to get to some destination that is beyond what appears to be our ground and so on. So, of course, I always use the analogy that here we are in, in uh, Maryland or, or Virginia or Georgia or Alabama, wherever we are, and we want to get to New York or someplace. And for us to get there, we have to travel this path. So once we get to the path, once we get on the path, and once we get to our destination, then we discover, then we find out that that fruition was always on the ground. We just didn't recognize it. But it took the pathway. For us to get there that pathway of purification that pathway of being able to one pointed mindfully be able to focus on the the purity of the ground the path and the result and see that they're all one simultaneous so this is the threefold vajra method of recognizing them. So first we talk about the ground as being the four ways of taking birth. And that we talked a few minutes ago about that, a womb birth, a, um, a, a, an egg birth, a heat and moisture birth, or a miraculous birth. And then we look at this in terms of whatever birth it is, we need to purify that birth. And we talked about that with the Bardo Todo. So the purifying the, the birth of whichever that process was. And 
forming a body within that within that um, um, that mode of birth was. So we say the four modes of birth. So whether it's in the womb, the body in the womb, or the, the body in the egg, or the body in the heat and moisture in the larvae, or the body in the lotus pistol. So this is this is the ground. This is from whence we we appear, from which we manifest. Then comes the the conception now is in concert with us this is the, the ground is is the egg and or rather the uh, the egg and the uh, or the ovum and the uh, and the sperm coming together so in concert with this is the seat of the sun disk is the ovum of the mother the moon disk seat of the father the samadhi of the causal seed syllable in which the seed syllable descends and takes its place in the deity seat is meant to purify the pure the period during which the bardo being's consciousness enters into the womb of the mother upon the merging of the red and white essences and then the body develops in the embryonic and fetal period so here is that conception so the ground is it's just you know here's the womb here's the body of water where the larvae is here's the the womb of the egg and the and the bird or here is the, the lotus pistol, here's the lotus flower itself. And here's the, the, the duality, here's the, the, the mother and the father, the egg, the, the uh, ovum and the, uh, and the father, the sperm. So whether it's, um, uh, uh, Adrian said last week, you know, is, is the egg at the, at the higher level at the throat and the sperm is at the bottom or is it reverse? It depends on the practice. I think, you know, I always remember it, I think, as being the ovum is at the top and the, the, the sperm is at the bottom. So if I said it wrong last time, uh, forgive me. But uh, right now, that, that's what I'm thinking now. But in any case, it's the point of those two things. And then, the, as it said here, it's the causal seed syllable. The causal seed syllable. This is the, that, um, if you want to call it an entity, that karmic being that now is coming in and is being conceived along with the egg and with the sperm. So this is the conception. And then it begins to grow as an embryo and, and so on like that. So it says the samadhi of the causal seed syllable in which the seed syllable descends and takes its place in the deity seat. So this is a meditation. to be able to experience that again during meditation and to be able to go through the generation of that, the generation stages of that, and to think of the, of the egg, to think of the ovum, to think of the sperm, to think of that coming together, and then thinking of that causal seed. So the causal seed, these seed syllables, you know, when we do Medicine Buddha, there's a there's a hung syllable. When we do uh, Avalokiteshvara Shenrezig, there's a, a Shri syllable. When we do um, Tara, there is, a, um, there is a, uh, a Tom syllable. So each of these deities have a seed syllable to them. And many of them have the same, you know, they're, they're, they're brothers and sisters in that respect, you know, so they don't each have their own exclusive seed syllable, but, the, you know, their associations may have, or those groups of them that may share the same syllables and so on. But the point is, getting to know what these seed syllables represent is very important, because that's the life force that is coming together with the, the physical aspect of the mother, the physical aspect of the father, now here comes this life force coming together, and then it begins to grow within the womb and so on. And we keep this life force with us throughout our lives. So if you've, um, if you've ever been with a, a, a lama who gives divinations, you know, a, a, a divine um, little, um, little exercise where 
you know, your life force, at least for that moment, is expressed through this, um, through this little ceremony. And you recognize, oh, that seed syllable, you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a Tom, maybe it's a Hum, maybe it's a Shri, maybe it's a Om, maybe it's a Ah, you know, whatever. And then you begin to see, oh, and then you begin to think about that and you begin to say, oh yeah, that life force, I'd be able to see how this works within me and so on. So, so that's the conception. So then, so that's the, that's the pathway the pathway and then the result becomes the tool or becomes the hand implement the the um the um the object the the appearance of a device that shows that demonstrates the enlightened activity of that particular being so it says here, when the seed syllable transforms into the hand implement of whatever deity you are practicing, this purifies the process of the consciousness entering into the melding of the white and red essences and the mind merging with them. So, you know, whether it is a, a, a Vajra, whether it's a, a double Vajra, whether it's a lotus flower, whether it's a, um, it's a, a Ratna, whether it's a, a jewel, um, or a, a flame, a fire, whatever it is. There's many different uh, 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 of these implements that are characterized that these deities are holding. So Tara, for instance, in both her hands, she's holding a lotus flower. So she's showing this, this, this compassion, you know, that has been able to overcome, you know, this ignorance and this suffering and so on. So she's got this very powerful, uh, very powerful purification aspect. Uh, Manjushri has in one hand, he's got a sword. So it's through this sword that he is cutting through ignorance. He's cutting through duality. So all these different deities have something in their hands like that. Sometimes, like in Buddha Shakyamuni, his both hands are in the Dharma position and he's holding the bowl of meditate on dharma nectar the dharma elixir the dharma the mendicant's bowl, the bowl of of uh, dharma so being able to read this to be able to see this and being able to experience this through your meditation so when we're doing the visualiz visualization stage and deity yoga you know we read two or three sentences and we kind of dismiss it but now we're getting to the point now where now we really can spend some time understanding what that means and processing what that means and so on. So we're just learning the basics of what this is. We're learning the vocabulary of what this is. So keeping these references close by to you is very important so that you can come back to these and you can look at these over and over again. Meditation, I've said many times, is not a passive thing. Meditation is a very active process. And we need to be able to engage the, the activity of the brain to examine and analyze and understand what all these objects are and what emotions they are overcoming and so on, what they are there for. We're going to see more about that as we continue on in this chapter how these all come together with each other. So, so this is the, the, the threefold Vajra method, the ground, the path, and the fruition. That where we are born, how we are born, the, the conception of, of how it came together, and then what the result of that is, what the, what the power of that is, what the identifier of that is, what the representative of that, what the symbol of that is. So, anybody have any questions or comment? I, I do have a question, Lance. Mm -hmm. So this might be um, um, me just being lazy, or uh, I don't know. But uh, I, so I understand the, the the concept of you know um, having to practice different um, you know yoga, 
um, deity yogas because there are different aspects of the mind and they might be helpful for different circumstances. Um, but can't you just like stick with one and then accomplishing them, accomplish them all? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But how do you do that? Well, this applies to how we do that. So that's what we're building out. That's what we're generating this. We're generating one right now. We haven't decided, we haven't chosen one yet, but we're, we're, it's the same process for any of them or in all of them. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So okay. we're just like, so say, say you want to stay with, with Shen Reza. That's fine. But now you know a whole lot more about what Jen, Shen Reza means than you might have an hour ago. How, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but how do you, how do you get to choose the, the, the yoga that you practice? It'll, it, 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 you try different ones. That's why we do different practices and you take different empowerments and you try them and you see, well, this one I really resonate with. This one really means something to me. I have a connection with this. And I'm going to stay with this one, you know, until whatever time. And then you find that, you know, you spend time with that particular deity as your yidam. That's your yidam. But then after a period of time, you may want to move on to another yidam. Now another one is, is you know, you want to understand a little bit more about that. So you move on to that. So, and, you know, you can certainly speak with your spiritual guidance, you know, with your, with your Lama, with your teacher and, and talk about it. But uh, it's basically that simple, you know, so you don't have to have one for life. You, you can move from one to another and then you keep them all, you know, they all become your yidams. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, you know, keeping it simple is very wise. You know, in the beginning, keeping it simple. And then you find that what you learn with one, you then can take and apply that generation stage to the next one. And it be the next one becomes very much easier. And then you take that to a third one, and that becomes even easier and so on. And then you begin to see all these similarities. And you begin to recognize the differences of their enlightened activity, the subtlety of their enlightened activity. Because that's the only thing that separates them. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Anybody want to stand up, take a stretch? Everybody comfortable? <laughs> All right, because I can keep on going. Okay. Um, we're likely to have to go to yet another week after this to get through this chapter because this chapter is just very, uh, uh, has a lot in it and it, it, we can't skip over any of it and, and not, you know, I couldn't do it and not feel remiss and in, in what, you know, being able to offer, you know, uh, this introduction to you all. Lance, I had a question. Okay. When you're practicing these, the the deity yogas it, it i don't know forgive my ignorance but it seems like there's a lot of devotion that, that's required to do this of course i mean sincere devotion i mean and you know that it devotion grows. Go, go ahead it grows the, the devotion grows so when you first start, you have some degree of devotion to want to do this. You know, maybe it's from past karma. Maybe it's from, you know, being influenced by uh, Dharma brothers and sisters or by a teacher or something like that. You know, there's, but then you find that the more that you um, involve yourself with this, the greater the devotion becomes. So the devotion is a very important part of that. Does that make sense, Tom? Completely. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much, Lance. Okay, very good. Right. And we're gonna we're gonna 
speak more about this as we get a little deeper through we're going to talk about you know the qualities of a human being that it takes to be on this pathway and devotion is one of those qualities so i don't want to get too far off track right now to go into that but we'll see how this all comes together you know everything in buddhism man it all comes together. It's that jigsaw puzzle that we've talked about so many times. We begin to see all those interior pieces starting to fit together once we got that frame together. And now we're going to see all those pieces coming together and so on. Slowly, slowly, one by one. Lance, can I ask yes. a question? Sure. We, in our prayers, a lot of the prayers, um, we say something like, um, you know, may, may I accomplish... Uh, Chinrezig or, or, or different yidams. What, what does that mean exactly? What are the what are the signs that that you've accomplished a, a, a yidam? Their activity. Okay, so your activities are the same as the as the yidams activities. Correct. So that does that mean like no emotions? Does that mean um, like when you go through your day to day life, you 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 never um, you never see yourself as you, I mean, you always, uh, you always arise as the deity. Well, as you go about, as you go about, if that makes sense. So in other words, like you don't think of yourself, or like I wouldn't think of myself as Amanda. I would think of myself as, as the, as the Yidam. So it's a loss of self, uh, letting go of the self. Well, we're going to get to it, you know, in this, in the next part of this chapter, we're going to get to that. Uh, but basically, you know, um, we don't totally stop becoming the ordinary beings that we are, you know, from a practical level. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. You know, because we're, you know, everyday ordinary people. As much as we want to be bodhisattvas and, and Buddhas, you know, we all have to, we got some work to do to get to that point. You know, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that we don't have glimpses of what it is to be those beings, not through vicarious experience but by actualization of becoming that deity for however long we could make it last. Maybe it was that, that fast in the beginning, but then it became much longer. It became much deeper, much more profound. And that's why we're, we're, we're doing all this foundational stuff so that you can maintain that, so you understand why it is there. And then, and then you begin to recognize yourself as you know, oh yes, I do have very strong compassionate qualities, just like Shen Rezig, because I learned them from Shen Rezig. I thought I knew what compassion was until I learned what compassion is from Shen Rezig. Now it's something else entirely. Or wisdom that I learned from Manjushri, or uh, courage, uh, uh, fearlessness that I learned from Tara. You know, all these things. We think we know what these things mean until we really experience them in true nature from these deities. These are the ultimate teachers. And it's all within ourselves. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. It does. Thank you. Okay. Lance, do we have time for another one? Of course. So we will go in uh, through uh, reminding ourselves uh, like the, there's different uh, birth process that deity also going through. Um, so uh, oftentimes in meditation, we, you know, imagine deity arising and then dissolving. Yes. So how, what is your understanding of this? Is it, um kind of like a reminding ourselves that you know that's how deities come and go or is that actually uh, actually temporarily we do give birth to a daily consciousness and do dissolve that destroy that every time when we go to meditation well, the, the, the deities are already there. 
all the deities are within us now. All that wisdom is within us now. But it's blocked up. It's confused. So what we're trying to do is to uncover the things that are blocking it up, which are the emotions and our wrong wisdom awareness. Once we do that, then we also need to be able to understand what they represent, what they mean, what the purity of what it is that they represent, to recognize that. Once we get completely naked, now we need to be able to recognize what, that, what we can do with that nakedness, what that activity is. Our true nature, right? Our true nature, yes. And then the spontaneous presence rise up. You know, spontaneously, spont spontaneously, things begin to change. Things begin to happen and so on because we become more and more stable in the actualization of that deity. Now, we may, we may fade out of it for a time, you know, but then we can bring it right back. We can come right back to it. And we do that over lifetimes. You know, but we do it over, you know, we can do it over this lifetime. You know, so when we really learn meditation, you know, we go into meditation and we go through this period of, of, of shamatha, calm abiding. And then we go through the period of, of, of vipassana. And then, you know, so, and what we're doing is we're liberating ourselves. So we're liberating ourselves. So in the same way that we liberate ourselves during the poa when we die, mm. when we drop our body, we're practicing to do that in the meditation, the dissolution. And then we become in the Buddha field, we become, we become the Buddha, the deity of that particular practice and so on. And then we stay there for as long as we can. And we may kind of fade in and out. And if our, our practice is strong, we can bring it back. If we begin to fade out, we recognize we're fading out, but we know we can get it right back and we can, we can get back to that, to that purity. And we can do that three or four or five times, you know, in a session. You know, a session could, could wind up being a day or two or three or four. You know, this is why we go on long retreats so that we can do this over extended periods of time. And then, go ahead. Uh, so how does it uh, connect to the birth of sun and moon disk? And uh, like that's... Uh, how does it connect so, with that? Yes. How is that connect with these two energies? Well, because what, what, what that represents, what the sun disk and the moon disk are representing is a, uh, a fundamental... Um, focus or power or characteristic of that particular deity that you are practicing. So in other words, if you're, if you're practicing um, Shen Reze, the main thing is going to be compassion, is going to be the moon disk. You know, the moon disk is representative of that. Mm. You know, if on the other hand, it's, it's, it's intense wisdom, then it may be that you are uh, 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 developing the awareness of, of, uh, of uh, Mahakala, the Dharma protector Mahakala, mm -hmm. because he's on a route of, of uh, so the, the wrathful deities, the fierceful deities, uh, excuse me, the fear, uh, fierce deities, or the, um, the Dharma protector are, are much more intense so that wisdom power that sun disk is more prevalent than the moon disk would be they're both there mm. but one is stronger than the other so as i said before you're going to see all this come together these questions will be answered. That kind of question will be answered a little bit longer, a little bit later on in our discussion with us. So you'll see these things coming together. 
You'll see how they come together. It's up to you to practice them coming together. So can we wrap this up in a way that so that we remind ourselves that we have a creative power to bring about the deities out of the sun, out of the moon. Uh, it's already created. Manifest. It's already created. It's already created. We're, we're, we're uh, recognizing that. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do anything except remove all these blockages and allow ourselves to recognize these things. It's already there. Mm -hmm. The notion okay. of creation is all a, uh, a part of uh, the phenomenal nature. We create all these possibilities. You know, the phenomenal nature is, is the, the realm of all these possibilities. Thank you. Okay. Okay, all right. These are good questions. These are good questions, and, and and you might want to write them down. I got all kinds of notes all around here where I've written questions to myself, and 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 I find out, you know, I answer them in another week or another six months or something like that, you know, where I ask ask my teacher or something like that. So these are all good questions. It's not a bad question. Okay, so now I'm going to move to the next outline where it says chapter seven, parts three and four. So now we're back to the seed syllable emanating and reabsorbing light rays. It says this purifies the process of the embryo, embryo forming in the mother's womb and the gradual development of the body, sense faculties, and constituent elements of by the working of the four elements. So the seed syllable. So remember when we do practices, when we are doing Shenrezi practice or, or Medicine Buddha practice or, or Tara practice, we visualize the seed syllable, whichever one it is, say it's a hung syllable. Mm -hmm. And we visualize that and light is coming from the seed syllable and going to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And then it always is that from the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, from them, it comes back into the seed syllable, comes back into us. It's being charged by them. It's being activated by them. It's being blessed by them. And now that seed syllable is way powerful. And now you are allowing that then to radiate out in all directions to all sentient beings. So whatever that deity yoga practice you're practicing, that light is going out, the, the mantra garland, you know, the light is going out to all those beings. And you visualize all beings now as being that particular deity. That's all part of the visualization process. That's all part of the mantra. It's all part of the, 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 uh, the dissolution. You know, they're all parts of that all coming together. So here it says, when we visualize the seed syllable emanating and reabsorbing light rays. So it's emanating the light rays to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, then it reabsorbs them when it comes back. And this purifies the process of the embryo forming in the mother's womb. Now think of yourself as sitting on the cushion as you being the embryo. You're in your, your everyday meditation. You are going through a rebirth. You've, you've, you've killed yourself. You know, you've liberated from yourself to get to this point. And now you're, you're being reborn. You're in the process of being reborn and receiving this blessing from the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, just as if you were an embryo in your mother's womb. But you're, you're, this is in your heart center and you're sitting on the cushion. But the metaphor, the analogy is the same. This is how 
the meditation is a microcosm of the Bardo Todal. That's how we can say that there is the six realms of, uh, or the six Bardos, and they're all tied together. So we can recognize how this works together. So the meditation is a rehearsal for the bardo, for the death and for the bardo of reality. So in this way, we're being reborn. So the embryo forming in the mother's womb and the gradual development of the body, sense faculties and constituent elements by the working of the four elements. So now we start putting it all back together. We've blown it all apart. Now we're bringing it back together. And what we're leaving out is all the junk that didn't belong, all the confusion, all the habitual tendencies, all the mental misconceptualizations. Uh, I don't need those anymore. And then ultimately you get up off the cushion and you're a lot more simple than you were before. You're a lot more peaceful than you were before. Your buddy Cheetah is a lot stronger than it was before because you realize you didn't need all that junk, you got rid of it. But then what happens is slowly we begin to let these things come back in. The contamination of, of, of Mars begin to come in. We purified, but then we let those, those contaminations come back in. You know? The kids start saying something to us, or our family members start saying something to us, or our job starts saying something to us. All the practical stuff of being a human being starts coming to us, and, and gradually, you know, we we begin to to leak, you know, that purity. Unless we're really strong, and if we practice every day, and we 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 become the embodiment of that purity, that's what we're working for. And we find that the two can coexist. We don't have to give up either one. However, we do have to be virtuous. We have to give up the non-virtuous. We have to give up the emotions. And we gladly want to do that. It doesn't mean we still don't love our children and our family. We still love them, but we, we love them in a cleaner, clearer way that helps them much more. It's a much freer love. It's a, more, it's a much more naked love. So each meditation is, is pregnant with the possibility of being reborn as a deity. So these four elements, the reference of the four elements, is now we're coming back into our physical body. So for this time, for us to be able to have this, this light experience of this transfer of light with the seed syllable within ourselves, we're beyond our body. We're beyond our physicality. We're beyond our intellect. You know? But then when we come back, then we come back and the elements begin, you know, the contaminations begin, you know, and they become very, very fundamental. The water, the, the earth, the fire, and the wind, you know, within our bodies, you know, we begin to feel those elements working within ourselves, but we can see them in their, in their true nature. The next paragraph says, when the seed syllable completely transforms into the deity body, this purifies the habitual imprints of the sentient being's body as it is fully formed and developed in the womb and becomes ready to be born. Through giving rise to the deity in this way, the habitual patterns of the other modes of taking birth are purified at the same time implicitly. So this is what I was just talking about. This has to be practiced over and over and over again. It can't be done vicariously. We can learn the vocabulary. We can learn the mechanics of the way it, it, you know, it, it seems to us, but we have to be able to um, allow this to manifest within ourselves. 
when we give rise to the deity in deity development stage practice, when we, I'm going to say it again, when we give rise to the deity in deity development stage practice, we need to have three elements intact. So what this means is we've had, we've had environment development. We've had Mandela Palace development. We've had seat development. This is what we've been talking about these past few weeks. Now we're talking specifically about the deity. So this is the deity development stage practice. There's three elements about this. There's the clear and vivid visualization. Being able to look at an image and being able to recognize that as Shenreze or as uh, white Tara or green Tara or red Tara or Manjushri or what have you, you name it. Being able to tell the difference not just in a color painting, a tanka, but also in the statues, to be able to recognize the body type, the, the hand positions, the elements, the implements that they're holding and so on, and that you can recognize who those deities are through that, through the clear and vivid visualizations. So this takes work. This takes practice. This takes, you know, study understanding this and remember again that these are spiritual representations of our true nature so it's not like gods that we're representing or we're trying to visualize gods it's not anything like that it is these wisdoms that are within ourselves this true nature that is within ourselves this buddha nature this indestructible nature within ourselves that's what we're trying to recognize So the clear and vivid visualization is number one. Number two is to have stable deity pride. Now, this is not the kind of pride that we have, oh, I'm such a good person. Oh, I've got such a wonderful house. Oh, I've got such wonderful possessions and a wonderful family. All this, this pridefulness, this, this, pride, this, this proudness that I have and so on, that is, that is full of uh, that is full of uh, pleasure and guilt and, and, uh, and um, all the emotions all wrapped up in it. Jealousies, if I don't have it, all these things. Very emotional pride. This is not that. This is a pure pride. And this is a pride that is full of humility. Because you would not be, if you have these experiences, you don't go around telling everybody, oh man, I had Shen raising today. Oh, I got such compassion. Oh, I got such wisdom. I'm, I'm Manjushri today. I made that one. You know, this is great. You know, this is wonderful. I'm so good. And it's not like that. It's a very humble, very humble, very, very soft, very subtle kind of a pride. And it may not be recognized right away by anybody. It doesn't need to be recognized by anybody. If you need to be recognized by somebody, then you haven't done it. You're not there yet. If you think, oh, I, I need to be recognized, this arrogance, this conceit that wants me to be recognized, it doesn't work that way. It's very, very, very subtle. And you'll meet some lamas, you'll meet some some other other beings who are very very humble and you would not know how what what realization they have had but if you are with them long enough over periods of time and through different circumstances that arise and see their stability see their compassion always being there see their joy always being there seeing their equanimity always being there, seeing their wisdom all being there. You know, this is what we see in, in um, Garchin Rinpoche. This is what we recognize in Garchin Rinpoche. This is what we're learning to see in Kampo Samdok. He's very humble. 
he will not tell you the things that he has experienced or things that he has been able to realize but through being with him and hearing what he says and the way he says it and so you begin to recognize that oh this is what this is what he's talking about he could only he could only know this if, if, if he had experienced it and it doesn't mean that we got to know everything it doesn't mean that these these beings know everything that they automatically have all this professorial wisdom about everything Gautam Rinpoche will be the first one to tell you that he does not know so much about the scripture and so much about the philosophy and so on. He always refers you to the to the Kempos. He says, you want to know about that stuff, go see the Kempos. He says, but if you want to learn how to meditate, talk to me. Listen to what I say. Follow my instructions. So there's a world of difference. So this is what it means to be a yogi. You know, a yogi is to be in union. You know, we can get in union through the scriptures. You know, we can have breakthroughs through the scriptures, through the teachings and so on. But there might always be a doubt until you actually experience it yourself, until you know it yourself, till you become in union with it yourself, till you become the yogi or yogini then nobody can ever take it away from you. You'll never lose it. It may fall away for a time, but if you want to give yourself enough time, you can bring it back. You never lose it. It was always there. So the stable deity pride, to recognize that you've had this experience, this experience is within you and it never leaves. It's always there. You are always the deity when you recognize that. And then that leads to the next deity and to the next deity and the next deity and so on. And then the recollection of purity. That's the third thing, the recollection of purity. That with this, that we can remember the pure nature of this deity and of the Buddha field in its entirety without having to get real into the minutia of it. But we can, recognize, we can recognize the purity of it. And we do that many different ways. Part of the way we do that is through our uh, associations that we make with the visualizations. So we're gonna get into that. But by, rec by recollecting the purity of these different aspects of the deity, leads us to uh, stabilize that within ourselves, that vividness, that clarity, and that, that pridefulness, that deity pride remains stable and it's because we always can recollect that purity. So it says, in all these cases, by relying on the practice of deity development, our grasping and fixation on mundane appearances and our mundane perceptions are purified. This is the result of meditating on such a path as this. So it says, our grasping and fixation on mundane appearances and our mundane perceptions are purified. So what that means is, we look at these things because they are tools. They are devices. They are one-pointed mindfulness that we let go. But these things bring us to this one-pointed mindfulness, and they represent this, this purity. And then, and then they do this effortlessly. And once we have that, then we can let go any associations with those things. We're not dependent upon them. And we use them as a means of communication to be able to help other beings and so on, to point out to them how these things represent these characteristics of the deity, just like you learn them to get to that point. You're no longer dependent on them, but other beings will be dependent on them, just like you will be dependent upon them until you can let them go, until you can be liberated like that. 
And we do that in stages. We do that a little bit at a time. And it becomes very effortless. So this is the result of meditating on such a path as this, the ground, the path, and the fruition. Appearances here refer to the appearance of all objects of our five senses, such as form and the rest. As a method of purifying these, we are first taught how to visualize with clarity and vividness. Having a clear, visual, having a clear visualization means visualizing the universe as the immeasurable deity palace and all within the universe as the deities recognizing all sounds as the nature of mantra and not letting the mind proliferate after objects so in the bardo todo we talked a lot about this, you know, about, about may all sounds be my own sound. May I recognize all sounds as my own sounds. May I recognize all lights as my own lights. May I recognize all rays as my own rays. So we begin to see the universe. We begin to see all the cosmos, all this phenomenal nature as the same thing, as this clear visualization of the deity and the, the deity field, if you will. But seeing it as, as this is the appearance of it, but there, is, but there is something beyond that. One way it's explained in some practices, they talk about that in the, in, in the, the male deity, in Yabyon, the male-female in consort, the male is the is the, the mind and the and the female is the body. So in a way it's saying that all this phenomenal nature is the body of the mind of the Buddha. And they are they're completely inseparable from one another. So this body has appearances to it that are displays of the mind. And when we begin to recognize all this as a display of that purity, everything changes. Everything that was ordinary now becomes extraordinary. Excuse me. Everything that was extraordinary, because we would think, oh, that's all an extraordinary point of view. Now that becomes ordinary, because now you're viewing it as the deity and that's the way the deity is it's ordinary for being a deity it's extraordinary to be emotional it's extraordinary to be confused it's extraordinary to be delusional to not recognizing these things that's what's delusional that's what's extraordinary most of our frustration that we're going through in the world right now is why don't these people realize how simple this is, how happy they can be, why we can't live as brothers and sisters, why we got to be destroying the earth, why do we have to be afraid of each other, why can't we open up and just, you know, be brothers and sisters and trust, learn to trust each other and to have compassion for each other when we're not that way and be able to use wisdom and guidance for them. Why can't we do that? Because we're looking at it with our ordinary mind that happens to be extraordinary and those beings are now extraordinary to us. Because we have become to some degree the ordinary embodiment of an enlightened point of view. We all have enlightenment within us. It's a matter of recognizing that enlightenment and leading an enlightened life. We're at the ground. The ground has it all. The pathway we get to find out what it all is, we get to the fruition and say, oh, I had that the whole time. 
it's really that simple. The Zen say, you know, they have many cones. And one of the great cones is, you know, in the beginning, when you're, when you're at the ground and you're first learning all this stuff as a beginner, you have to chop wood and carry water. You know, being practical, doing all these things that we do in our ordinary lives. And then we go all through this austerity. We go through all these practices. We go through all these teachings. We go all through this realization and everything. And we get to enlightenment. And then we find out we still have to chop wood and carry water. But we're doing it with a whole different point of view. So now, first in the beginning now of this of these uh, of this clear and vivid visualization, uh, when you are sharpening your visualization, you hold your attention on the overall presence of the entire mandala and the deities appearing simultaneously, and on the overall form of the principal deity. So what this means is. Kind of like when we um, when we recite the seven limb prayer through the power of Samantapadra's prayers, may all the Buddhas manifest vividly in my mind. I prostrate to them, multiplying my body as many times as there are atoms of the earth multiplying my body as many times as there are atoms of the earth. In each atom, I visualize as many Buddhas as there are atoms, surrounded by countless bodhisattvas. Thus, all space is filled with Buddhas and bodhisattvas. That's what this means here. Hold your attention on the overall presence of the entire mandala and the deities appearing simultaneously. Did you begin to recognize all this as being this, the Buddha, in ways that are unimaginable for us to be able to talk about, to comprehend, much less be able to talk about. And then the overall form of the principal deity. So the deity that you're focused on. Now, okay, here's all these Buddhas, but I'm going to focus on this one. And this one leads to all the others. That's why we say, if you know one deity, you know them all. So then we visualize every minute detail of the deity that we are exploring from the crown protrusion at the top of the deity's head, all the way down to the seat and the throne. So if I go back to um, the white Tara, let's see if I go back here, and then I go here. So if I go here from the crown, you know, so I begin to look and, and, and study and remember all the different body aspects of that particular deity. From the crown protrusion at the top of the deity's head all the way down to the seat and the throne. Seeing every aspect of the deity's form, the hand implements, the minute details of the ornamentation and so forth. So in the practices, they will identify all those things. And, the more you get into the, the, um, the, uh, the higher level deities, they get more detailed. So when we get into the highest yoga tantra and so on, it gets more and more into it. And the peaceful deities, they're very simple, very simple, which is very wise. We start off very simple. But then even with them, we learn the simplicity of them. And then as we get to the next step of some of the higher deities, 
then they get more complex and so on. But we begin to recognize all these different things and, and we are sitting and we're visualizing this all in front of us. Remember, we talk about we take the deity card and we take the deity card and we hold it up in front of ourselves and above ourselves like this. And then what that means is we're, we're visualizing it like this. And then as we get more and more um, uh, stable with that, when we recall that, then the deity comes and sits on top of our head like this. And then slowly, slowly, the deity comes down into our heart like this. So, but in the beginning, we have to work on this visualization. So we should be able to do this from memory. It's not something that we have to take and read the book and look at the picture and everything. We got to do this to the point that we become the embodiment of this. That it becomes second nature to us, you know. And that's why it's wise to start with one deity first, you know. And then once you get that down, you can talk about other ones. But if you start with one first, whether it's Shenrezeg or it's Tara or whomever, you know, keep it simple. And then it's very easy to remember all the different characteristic parts. Um, so when you've gained clarity and vividness in this, then you can see in your mind's eye the entire mandala and deities within all at once. And gradually your visualization will become more and more crisp and vivid until it is like stars and constellations shining vividly on the surface of a limpid lake, a limpid clear lake. Limpid means uh, clear, without any obscuration, without any blockages, perfectly clear. So we begin to recognize this. We begin to see this. So we see the deity, and then we see the deity, and then we see the deity in this mass of, of space and all these other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas all being part of this, the deity being surrounded by all these other Buddhas and all these Bodhisattvas. And then the, usually we'll say being surrounded by all the lineage lamas. You know, we'll be able to see that. And we'll see all the Dakinis and the Dharma guardians. So depending on the practice, how elaborate this becomes. But the point here is to memorize these things, to spend time to do this. Keep your attention single-pointedly focused and rest your mind naturally. You can begin by visualizing and focusing on whatever is easiest for your mind to attend to and gradually expand. There is no set way or order or number of times one must do this. It is something that, begin, that can be attuned to the individual's constitution. So what works for somebody doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. What works for you might not work for me and so on like that. So you got to go at your own speed. You know, that's one of the gifts that we give ourselves to recognize that we are on schedule. We are on time for our own liberation. Don't confuse it with somebody else's. Don't be in too big a hurry. Take your time. So I think this is a good place to stop for tonight. So I hope this uh, helped a little bit. And uh, I'll bet that It'd be fun to go through the rest of this in one sitting, but it's likely to be another two. So if you want to read ahead, be my guest. And, uh, and this is straight from the book. So if you don't have the book, this is the book. I just put it in a different format that is easier for us to follow and emphasizes the meanings and, and so on like that a little bit as I, as I can express that. So does anybody have any questions or comments? This is very helpful. Thank you, Lance. You're welcome. Yeah, I don't have any questions. Okay. All right, very good. Thank you.
Is it changing your mind at all? Yeah, uh, uh, lots, lots of um, good, good information for sure. Are you feeling more comfortable with it? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I think um, there's just just a lot of um, um, things that you explained tonight that uh, I was just um, kind of like. Um, I cannot exactly pinpoint uh, which one in particular it was, but it was in the back of my mind and I wanted to get an explanation of that. Um, and that kind of like, you know, kind of like you said, it just like brings it all together like, like a puzzle. So definitely. Okay, good. Okay. So you're seeing how all these building blocks are working together and so on. Yeah, definitely. And uh, have some of your mental misconceptions been kind of blown away? Alex, what do you think? Well, actually, I think uh, like many things that I thought I was not sure if I was getting it, but I think I found a lot of confirmations from my own intuitive understanding uh, of, of uh, this process. Okay. So thank you for for like making it even more clear. Sure, sure. Michael, how about you? With your experience, you know, being a practitioner for a number of years in a slightly different, you know, tradition. But with this, how, how does this land with you? Uh, it it took me a while to to warm up to the sort of esoteric edges. Um, um, I, I enjoy visualization, but, um, the, the more I read and listen and contemplate and meditate, the more, uh, the more I'm, I'm sort of realizing that visualization isn't just an expedient means that it's just not, it's not all about allegory and, and metaphor that it's actually about manipulating uh the the parts of reality that uh that i think are i think are starting to make me um uh, a more uh, a better person and a more active uh uh thinker a more active ingredient in my own uh growth so i've gained a a deep a deep respect for the practices uh, whereas, as I said previous to that, um, I understood them to be expedient means, um, managing metaphor, uh, but it's a lot deeper than that, <laughs> hugely deeper and very profound. And I'm just, um, I'm very pleased that whatever I did in the past lives to, to, uh, to, to, to get familiar with this stuff and to come back around with this group to um, to visit it again uh, I, i'm just feeling blessed to be in a good space very good thank you tom how about you you have any comment you've been practicing for a long time i know in in uh, the zen tradition how, how does this land with you it's making sense um it's really um bringing things together and uh, I can almost see why things happen for the reason why they happen. And uh, I don't know, it almost feels like uh, this was the right next step, you know? And uh, all my other uh, practices that uh, has brought me to this point, and there was a reason why. And I'm very grateful for uh, awakening that, Lance. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. Curtis, how about you? We haven't heard from you tonight. Um, <clears throat> I was very, uh, <clears throat> very intent on tuning in. 
I guess it's been last week and this week, or has it been two weeks before? I think it's been two weeks. The third week we're on this, right? Uh, yes. I was very intent on this because it's um, it's it's the big one of the big ideas in Tibetan Buddhism is the idea of visualization of the deity as a uh, expedient means of uh, purifying ourselves. And it, um, I find myself thinking a lot about the use of icons. Um, I think both the use of icons in the Eastern Orthodox Church and, uh, you know, deity yoga uh, involve the imaginative function of the, of the of qualities of the brain as opposed to the intellectual or the devotional. You know, it's, it's imaginative. It's, um, it's what? What was that last word? Imaginative. It uses Imagin our imaginative yeah. functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, it it's, um, uses the artistic functions. And um, I think most of our exposure uh, in spirituality is to intellectual and devotional. And, and uh, you know, and this is, this is really working on that other dimension, the imaginative. Okay, great. Jerry, you have any comment? I think he's he's uh, flirting in the zone. He's zooming. Okay. All right, Gary. I was asking if you had any comment. Now you got to turn your microphone on. Yeah. Maybe I can do it for you. Yeah. I guess not. I can't turn yours on. Okay. Amanda, did you have anything else to add? Um, just, just, it just reiterates, I, I just keep thinking over and over that it just reiterates um, the importance of, of doing this, these practices, this Yidam Deity practice every day, no matter what, even if you only have time to do it for five minutes, that's, um, it's, it's just that consistency and, and devotion and, and discipline um, that, that I think really, um, really will, will have results. Um, <clears throat> what, what about, what about study and reading, you know, doing, you know, some investigations some research and trying to fathom, you know, some of the, uh, you know, some of the symbolism and some of these deities and reading about them. Oh yeah, I think all that's good too. Um, yeah, definitely. I think, <laughs> I think, um, and I'm sure everyone can relate to this. Um, my my experience right now, being a practitioner um, and a and a mom and having a family, um, uh, you know, whether it's a family or, or a job or whatever it is, um, it's um, it's just the key for me is trying to balance those things um and and always you know um practice is always a, a priority um so so yes <laughs> i've started um i think i picked up milarepa's is the oh the hundred thousand songs of milarepa is that that's correct oh that's great yeah. oh i love it so much and i've read about two-thirds of it oh, and i like I, I don't ever want to put it down, but all these other things come up and then I always think, oh, well, I, you know, I can't miss my practice. Um, so I'll, I'll finish it one day. <laughs> I will. But yes, there's so many books that I that I want to I want to finish and some that I want to reread right. um, and some that I just think about all the time. Um, I think Blazing Splendor. I think about some of those stories I'll, I'll, two or three times a week. Something will just it'll just pop up from from. Um, from that memoir. Um, so yes, yeah, that's so important, Lance. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Lance, uh, this is Gary, I've managed to wake up my mic. I don't know what happened. Yes. <laughs> but uh, I, I can say I've, got, I've read the book and I realize that I have to go through it uh, many more times, but I realize I think more importantly to me that um, Understanding this, uh, uh, you, you have to enter a realm beyond words. You read the words, you understand definitions, uh, 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 
terms, uh, uh, deity yoga, uh, bodhisattva, and uh, philosophy, but there is a realm beyond words that you can feel but perhaps not say is, is what I'm getting from this. And of, of all the participants here, I'm probably the most neophyte of all. And the newest, and uh, I realize that it, it, it is a long but fascinating road. Uh, but I'm just getting started, and I'm going to have this book in my hands many more times. I can see. Yes, very good. Yes, and, and uh, William and Bonnie, how about, do you guys have any comments? It's good to have you with us tonight. Uh, William and Bonnie are friends of Curtis, and they have been joining us the past couple of weeks. And so uh, they're, they're on our email list now and, uh, and say that they're enjoying this. So do you have any comment, William and Bonnie? Uh, William isn't here right now, but um, I've heard a, many of the principles that you've talked about before, and I really appreciated hearing them again and expanded upon the way you have. Um, I had to miss part of it because we had a dog that had an upset tummy oh. and I had to cook oatmeal and rice for him with yogurt to feed him because he was telling me he was hungry. <laughs> okay. But thank you. Really appreciate it. William had to step away from the table for a little bit. All right. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad that you're joining us. I hope that you continue and, uh, and I hope you printed the, tech, the text here and, and maybe you have a chance to go back and read it. And maybe you'll have some questions and don't hesitate to write me or call me and, uh, you know, we can talk to in a week in between time. Yeah. Thank you. Thumbs up. Appreciate that very much. Okay. And what you're doing here is really wonderful. You're helping so many of us. Well, thank you. Well, we have wonderful people here. Yes, I agree. <clears throat> and Amanda wishes your dog well. <laughs> I just saw a, a chat pop up. <laughs> thank okay. you. Okay. Well, thank you all for uh, staying with me and. Uh, we should do our dedication prayers. So if we can uh, go to page 18 in our book. And um, and Bonnie, if you don't have this book, uh, it is available. Uh, you can print it or I can mail it to you. So, um, but it's got our, our fundamental prayers in here. So these are the lineage dedication prayers. Nice, so we'll recite these. Dorje Chang, Tilopa, Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa, Dharmalur Gampopa, Tagma Drupa, Lordri Kumpa, please bestow upon us the most auspicious blessings of all the Kaju Lama. By this virtue, may I achieve the all knowing state, and may all who travel on the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death cross the ocean of samsara by defeating all enemies, confusion, the cause of suffering. Bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind, where it is unborn, may it arise. Where it is born, may it not decline, but ever increase higher and higher. I pray that the Lama may have good health. I pray that the Lama may have long life. I pray that your Dharma activities spread far and wide. I pray that I may not be separated from you. As Manjushri, the warrior, realized the ultimate state, and as did Samantabhadra, I will follow in their path and fully dedicate all merit for all sentient beings. By the blessing of the Buddha who attained the three kayas, by the blessing of the truth of the unchanging Dharma as such, by the blessing of the indivisible Sangha order, may the merit I share bear fruit. By the virtues collected in the three times, by myself and all beings in samsara and nirvana, and by the innate word of virtue, may I and all sentient beings quickly attain, unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious enlightenment. May the teachings of the great Tri Kompa Ratna Shri, who is omniscient, Lord of the Dharma, master of interdependence, continue and increase through study, practice, contemplation, and meditation until the end of samsara. Om, ah, hom. Om, ah, hom. Om. Ah, home. May the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened ones become inseparable with my body, speech, and mind. So thank you all again, and uh, we'll see each other next week.
And if anybody is in mind to, uh, Kempo is going to be teaching tomorrow on um, the supplication of, to the seven Taras. He's going to continue that teaching, which is very, very good. And uh, he's going to be getting into the really thick of the medical, me metaphysical part of things. So it'll be very interesting.